Okay, hello everyone and welcome to this um, webinar interview. I'm Francis Seeley from Globalnet 21 and this is one of the interviews that we do regularly in uh, Enfield Voices and uh, we've got with us today Mary Duggan who is a local poet. Uh, she does um, quite a lot of activities, she works with a lot of groups and gets involved with many, many um, uh, organizations, schools, and so on. And she's going to tell us about that. Uh, you can actually see her here today. And you can also see Kate Davis, who's going to help with the interviewing. So welcome, Mary. And thank you, Katie, for helping with us today. Okay, Mary, so you're here and you're going to tell us about the work you do. Now, obviously, you work uh, and have been working for a long time on poetry in our community. What, what's your background? What made you do it? What really inspired you? Um, well, I, th I, I come from an Irish family and my father always used to juggle words and we always used to talk as I grew up philosophically. <clears throat> and I had quite a, a lot of difficult uh, times in my life. Um, I was a sick child as well. So I think um, much of that has influenced me reaching out but the most important thing I think was my um, education at a convent school at St it's called St Anne's now in London Road where the nuns were there and it was a very spiritual upbringing rather than academic and um, I, um, I think that suggested there was there were mysteries to uncover and that informs quite a bit of my poetical work but i do and always have loved words okay katie um and, and with your work in poetry mary what, what is it that you're hoping to achieve from the work that you do in that area well i it's a very organic growth um, I love people, I like to stop and listen to people, watch people. I love communities and I love enter community. And I just enjoy bringing people together. So if I can bring poets together, or as I've done with my workshops, free workshops at festivals and such like, um, families together. And if we can support um, literary things going on in Enfield for people to express and improve their well-being. I think it's a great joy and it's a great joy to talk to literal ones and what they say is completely amazing and fresh. So to you Mary it's not just about creating love of poetry it's also about building community is it? It is very much so trying to draw another thread along and um, for us to all sing in harmony. <laughs> Harry, recently um, I understand you spoke at Speaker's Corner. Sadly, I wasn't able to make it on the day. Can you just tell us a bit more about what you did there? Well, first of all, the sun was shining, so that was a marvellous start, yes, and Francis was there, of course, and Rupert Price, who I hadn't met before, either of them before, and in person. And I brought, I thought it was a wonderful opportunity, I'm part of Palmer's Green um, group, Facebook group, and um, I saw that they were doing a speaker's corner, and I thought it was a wonderful opportunity to bring poets, local poets plus others together, to offer a chance to hear their voices. I also did a poem that is central to Palmer's Green, which I um, was asked to write for the dedication of local suffragettes, the most radical cell being in Palmer's Green. So it's a fun poem with a lot of heart and a lot of um, important history within it embedded. And I was a scullery maid for that. So I performed as a performance poem. And then we had eight other wonderful poetic voices, including an American who talked about the Deep South. Uh, it was an amazing time. We loved it. So how did you like that idea of doing this in the open air with a lot of other events? Was that quite a fun thing to do? I have. Um, brought a lineup of 17 poets to the 400th 
enter market celebration as a poet, as a poet's corner. This was something different, I felt. This was connected to the London um, legacy of Speaker's Corner, and I love the idea of the whole fusion. Okay, well, that, that's really good to, to hear you say that. Katie? Um, yes, yeah, so there's, obviously there's quite a lot of um, historical um, work and um, purpose to some of the work you've done around poetry, but it's also about building communities in the current day. Um, and you're involved in a few local poetry groups, I understand. I am. Um, I actually um, um, originated, well, it certainly then as an idea to do what we call found poetry. You just cut up lots of bits of words, sentences, lists, etc. from any newspaper, magazine, images, so it's totally accessible. I've had three-year-olds, eight-year-olds, seven-year-olds, adults, families, um, all sorts of people with challenging conditions doing these workshops for free, mostly. I was part of the Enfield Literary Festival workshop at the Dugdale with this as well. All the um, produce from this will be going into my exhibition in February, running the whole of February in the Dugdale Centre, 2019. Um, and I hope people will come. It's a community exhibition of creative um, input by the community, a word to poem, collages. I mean, that, that, that's quite interesting what you were saying, because we, we talked about poetry being used to build communities, but you also are saying with the people you work with, sometimes it has a healing function as well, that it helps people to gain confidence, that it helps them to heal themselves and have well-being. So you're looking at, at, at not just as an art form, but as a therapy as well. I have discovered that great um, power myself. Um, yes, from it. Um, we had um, at the Ukraine, Spirit of Ukraine Festival I did as well, we had some interesting pieces given in. Um, um, children, ch uh, well, um, young um, people actually they were, chose some eco um, uh, themes. Uh, so obviously that was close to their heart. Some chose some rather dark emotional themes about communication. Um, some chose themes about freedom of expression as uh, young people. So it's a fascinating measure. We don't always or can't always find a voice. So sometimes in those small things, we can lay that voice onto paper and sometimes we can, if we want to, share it publicly. Other people can relate to it as well. Great. So it sounds like poetry can be a really good creative outlet um, for some people. But what would you say to some people who are listening thinking, oh, I just can't write poetry or I don't know how to go and get started. How would you encourage those people to get involved? Well, this is what my workshop was doing. Basically, you just cut, you select what, from what is cut out and you just dip it down in whichever order you like on a blank piece of paper. So you're making your own theme and your own voice from it. Um, and there are images there as well. So if it was totally image-based, we could draw a poem from it, translate it, as it were. So it, was, it would be totally accessible. I'm actually working with an autistic lady who has, she's about seven or eight in her mind. And um, we're slowly drawing responses from her. And um, I'm very, it's a great joy. It's a great joy. So when, when you work with people, do you get them to love poetry in terms of, you know, the poems that have already been written? Or do you encourage them to write their own poetry, to express their own inner feelings? I um, do not leave them. I let them be. Um, I do not expect a poem in the crafted sense of the word. Um, I am happy for them to play with words because words are the seeds of a poem when you learn to control and order 
those words and use them very selectively, then that's when you move on to doing poetry. But it takes a long time. When I first started, and I first read at um, Palmer's Green Poetry from the lectern at St. John's, I did a sort of Scottish balladic poem. But I had to learn over a long period of time to give myself space, not be so abstracted. So it, it does take a while, but um, even if you get rhyme into your poem somewhere, it skips along nicely, catches the air. Everything that anyone does to express um, and use word is, is a fantastic thing. Everyone is so individual. But it sounds like you feel like words can have a lot of power, and I think that's probably something that we all recognise. Um, obviously, you know, a lot of what Emford Voices discussed is this kind of politics. What sort of role do you think poetry has in that? Poetry, um, well, I, I, I see politics as very, very broad. There's the politics of everything, the politics of social, the politics of political, the politics of finance, the politics. Um, Poetry uh, can be um, obviously political. Um, uh, you know, I'm part of a WASPy women's movement and uh, poetry has been written for that. Uh, my suffragette poetry poem, uh, I'm actually doing an international women's conference this year at Manchester. I'm headlining with it. Um, that's political in the sense it's feminist poetry. Um, I think, um, yes, often we can use real poetry to draw the emotions and draw people to understand how we feel about a particular thing, but it doesn't have to be um, political, it can be the politics of anything, manipulation, behaviour, anything. <laughs> Yes, I, I remember when I was talking to you about this and I said that uh, poetry could lead to political action. You told me off and said, no, 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 call it social action. Poetry can lead to social action. And in a way, you're right, aren't you? It's much broader than politics and it deals with people's lives and how they deal with it in communities. It gives them sort of some self-worth as well. But it also does deal with historical political situations. Tell us about what you did on Oldman's Hill with the suffragette anniversary, because that was very exciting. That was very exciting. Um, I was asked by the London Bar of Benfield to write um, something um, for this dedication to the local suffragettes. Not many people know that the um, local Palmer's Green and the brother and sister of Emily Pankers lived in Palmer's Green and Winchmore Hill, Southgate, Suffragettes, they, and men and women, they were all uh, a, a, a part of a radical cell linked with Emily Pankers directly. Um, and there was a fracas recorder, well, in the recorder newspaper of 1914, the Palmer Screen Recorder, about suffragettes clashing with men. So I actually embedded this into my poem, and I, my poem was from a working class point of view about a scullery maid who was listening to all the voices, the mistress, the master in the household, um, the cook, uh, all about the war and whether she should join or not and why. Um, and it was um, quite colourful and I dressed up and I think people enjoyed it. But we did reenact a clash at Palm Spring Triangle. We dedicated a plaque, anyone and everyone can see there now, still there. Then we went down to Southgate Town Hall and um, I did my poem in front of MPs, councillors and uh, communities, members of the public, and um, we had a wonderful time. We had very good speakers there. And we had a group of young people as well who were involved in politics. So it's a wonderful um, moment. It sounds like a wonderful event, actually, and um, I'm very sorry that I didn't get to see it. Um, it's interesting that you wrote um, from the perspective of a scullery maid. Would you say that um, poetry doesn't discriminate against um, voices? You know, anybody can, it gives everybody a voice, would you say? 
Well, I can do one. I can do a Cockney voice to my pub poem if you want. It's very <laughs> short, okay? In a riot to an ape, as he saw her at the gate, as her hat fell off, he thought it was a laugh. So she told him where to go, but he said, Hello, we've got a right spicy one here. Calm down, have a beer. <laughs> Calm down, have a beer. What do you take me for? You've got some door. So he left her at the gate in a right to an eight. He left her in a state by that swinging garden gate. I remember the accent at uh, Oldermans Hill and it was quite funny because, you know, you were reenacting all the hassle that took place as many years ago and the bystander who was coming along and didn't know what the hell was going on was <laughs> sort of running like heck thinking, you know, there was a real, you know, real riot on Oldermans Hill, but it was, it was really fantastic. Um, but, but I mean, Katie's question is quite a good one. I mean, poetry sometimes in this country we think is sort of a rather elitist thing, but it's for everyone, isn't it? Yes, I don't, I don't, um, I, I, I tend to write conversationally and song-like um, because of my background. Um, I'm a, a bit of a lyrical poet, but I can write gritty, dark, mysterious pieces like Poe, you know, Blake, like anything like that. I, I, skip around with all sorts of styles. I write even I do one that's about an anaconda. It's called Anaconda um, and it's done in a deep south um, drawl. Um, I love doing persona poems. I mean it's for everyone. I, I, I don't, uh, I can't do high, high culture poems possibly because I'm not from that, although Solzhenitsyn, Dostoevsky and Chaucer are some of my favourite pieces, Virginia Woolf, you know, but, but, and Seamus Heaney, and, and, you know, but I, I, I find it very hard to do that. I prefer the sort of ordinary conversational style, yeah. Um, so you, so you asked, uh, mentioned quite a few poets just then, actually, and one of the questions that we've had is, um, what other poets inspired you? Who, who have been your inspirations as poets? Well, um, I think you'll see, can you see that book, Seamus Healy? Yes. Yeah. This is a new uh, publication by Favour and Favour. I was there that evening when they were launching in London with my favourite Edna O'Brien and an author of country girls, etc. Um, I would say, um, like, um, um, uh, oh, I, I can't remember her name, um, it, uh, Sylvia Plath, um, my favourite, and you'll be surprised at Sylvia Plath's choice, WB8, one of my all-time men, because I'm a romantic as well as Walter de la Mer, but I just as much like William Carlos Williams, um, um, Walt Whitman for his listings, um, although I don't tend to use them myself, a lot of poets do. So Eliot is wonderful. I do have some Eliot type sounds in some of my poems. You know, uh, Larkin, you know, yeah. And, mm -hmm. and, and Jacob Poli, who's who won, won last year, I think, the T.S. Eliot Prize, who's a, a, an amazing um, young uh, poet. You, you've sort, you sort of placed yourself in the genre of the early 20th century, haven't you? The Country Girls and Sylvia Platt and Seamus O'Healy and, and, and so on. I mean, do you have any other favourites that over the years? I mean, like, what about Emily Dickinson? I would have thought she was right down your street. Well, some people, it's funny you should pick her out because some people, I mean, it's lovely when I hear that, I have likened some of my work to that. It's, it's very strange out yes absolutely and some some um, Welsh women poets and things like that but you know I, I'm I'm very interested in learning more about hip hop grunge rhyme and spoken word I mean there's so much poetry it's so passionate now poetry and people and young people really don't think anyone can do it and it's in song anyway it's not so far removed because it is song so and um, it's a wonderful time to express yourself 
and 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 just keep going at it. You know, that's hip hop poets and beat poets and all the different poets. They did it all, all just 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 started from nothing, and people have just liked what they heard. Thank you. Um, so it sounds like there's been, you talk about quite a lot of drama in your poetry and um, that using the different voices and also kind of the nature of lyrics. Are there sort of other creative outlets that you're interested in as well, Mary? Do you do much sort of singing or drama? I sort of imagine that you might do that kind of thing as well. I particularly like your accent, so. <laughs> well, I had a long time of speech therapy and so then when I went to secondary I had had speech therapy. When I went to secondary school I had elocution lessons and that uh, we also did the art of choral verse and we should go uh. and teach. And that was the first opening to me of uh, and 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 Yates actually funny enough um you know I chose him to do in the in City of Guilds and and so for me, um, I, I, I was a shy child, but um, I, I had that sort of personality where I was supposed to be Irish, and it, drama comes easily to me. But I don't in no, just just poetry, and um, I do voluntary work for um, uh, Great Ormond Street um, a group. Um, and I'm going to do some work with them, workshops with them. Hopefully they'll be in the um, um, Dovedale um, exhibition as well, uh, which would be lovely. Um, so I do a lot of work with women's campaigning as well. And I have a huge amount of Eastern European friends and, and poetry friends. And I do um, an allotment and so there's a huge community, a local allotment here, and I'm learning about permaculture. I want to do that. So I'm pretty fully engaged. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm on my bicycle. I've done Emperor Cycle. They taught me to get back on my bike. And um, years ago, I um, led an American tourist 600 miles across England and Scotland. And um, for, the, for a special group, um, the um, of, of bringing young kids out and things like this. I got this job and I haven't been on the bicycle since and now I'm on the bicycle. I only go to the allotment and back at the moment and I, but I go on the road. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Well, that, 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 sounds, that sounds interesting. You also do work with schools, don't you? I want to do more work with schools. Um, you want to tell us about that? I, 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 only, I have only done work with um, families and children from schools. I haven't yet managed to be invited into a school. They all seem to be busy and things like I would love to, and I'm, I'm covering that before the exhibition starts to get children to do that. But I have taught, strange enough, this workshop, it's very strange you'll find this, in a secondary school in Slovenia. And that was the first time I did this to experiment with it. And we set it up with the head of English and um, so it fulfilled their curriculum needs of speaking English, exploring words and actually um, controlling and focusing on a blank piece of paper to create something and we ended up with an installation, art installation of their work being pegged on a, um, a washing line um, yeah, it was very exciting. The, the young people, they were about 14, 15, 16. They really enjoyed it. Okay, Katie. Fantastic. Um, actually, that was one of the questions we had from uh, one of our viewers, actually. Do you think there's more that schools can be doing to um, encourage children to get involved in poetry and other sorts of literary exercises? Well, I know that the school on my street, Trinity Street, had um, in June some sort of poem um, thing, but I did ask to be invited along and to help, but there, there was no reply because they are tremendously challenged at the moment. So it's very hard for them to sort um, the collaboration with external uh, persons, given that you might need a DBS, given that they need teachers to be called out or teaching assistants. It's very hard, but I am collaborating and we're hoping to maybe get George Spicer through a contact I have through Bushel Park Friends, 
we are hoping to get George Spicer's involved um, in, in this, but I agree with you. But it is literally logistics sometimes that stops it. So, so if people are listening to you now and they wanted to get involved in poetry, do they make contact to you? How do they get involved? What do they do? Well, um, I think the, the best thing might be to go through Enter Voices. Um, I have a, a, an email address and I'm very happy then to make contact with them after that um, through my email address. And so we'll go from there. But I really welcome it because my, as I say, my exhibition is in February. I'd like to just show you if I can two pieces of work i won't read it all but from my workshops if that's all right is it Katie? Okay. okay yep this says i don't know whether you can see this can you see this yep yeah right i'm going to turn it away now um it says every picture tells a story and it says by 17 year old what is life? This is not an attempt to answer the big question, but a near tip of the iceberg perspective to try and understand the depth of something this deep. Life is being alive. To live is to breathe, to love and die. And there it is. If I just show you again, she's got the skeleton part. Can you see that? Yeah. Um, yeah, so that was one of them. Now, this is by a seven-year-old, I think. And um, um, if I can just hold that up, can you see that? Yep. Right, this is the tree of life. Leaves and branches, a trunk and roots sway in the wind as the trumpet goes toot. Hidden treasures hiding in the roots, swaying in the wind as the trumpet toot. Leaves to the branches, branches to the roots, sway in the wind as the trumpet goes to. That's a seven-year-old. That is what they did. Oh, wow, well, that's fantastic. You know, so that just gives you an idea. To talk about well-being, we don't know who this was, so it's anonymous. If I might show you, it's at the top of the dystopian um an image which they selected from my all my images and underneath are two um young um women looking at quizzically and the, there is an, an a, a title interview on it and the words say why can't you hear me mum mum can you hear me and then it says in green it, they stuck don't miss a final chance. Now that's haunting. We don't know who did it. We don't remember seeing anyone. So, that, so that's reaching out. Yeah, I mean that that was that was quite deep, and, and for a child of seven to say that, I mean, that is a child of seven. This one. Oh, we that. No, yeah. we don't know who did this one. Uh, the anonymous one, yeah. Okay, but that, I mean, that, that was reaching out. Anyhow, Mary, we've sort of come to the end of our time now. And um, that's been really interesting to find out what you're doing and what motivates you, what makes you tick, and the passion you bring with it. So thank you for doing it. And thank you, Katie, for helping us. And uh, your questions were really, really great. But Mary, I know you want to play us out with a poem, which I gather is the Enfield Cedar, Planting Trees, which I gather was inspired by two books, The Man Who Planted Trees and The Little Prince. So we're going to let you play us out with the poem and then the webinar will finish. So thank you again for doing it. Thanks, Katie. And over to you, Mary, for the grand finale. It's been an absolute pleasure, Francis and Katie. Thank you for such a relaxing and wonderful interview. And this is Enfield Cedar, Planting Trees. The children beg nature to plant and germinate a magnificent seed for a remarkable cedar tree, to make it higher than a ladder for the eye to follow to the sky. And they painted it forever green, each unfolding umbrella, a branch to give shelter from a rumble of rain, and shaded a yellow haze of stippled dots to show the sun shining through. Then, 
pressing down on pencil lead, they outline its magnificent spread, hung low like the gangly goose's neck they saw on the river front, then swept up like an elephant's trunk, for a playful squirrel or child to climb. The chocolate barks wave of limbs in a library park to welcome every each and every visitor, and nature so pleased she agreed to nurture the seed as they continued painting forests. It's about the imagination. Okay, thank you, Mary, and thank you, Katie. And uh, thank you very much. And good, good night for now. Good night. Good night, all.